أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, I am Ustada Amina Blake. I am very, very happy and very pleased to have my first lecture um, on this page. Alhamdulillah. So, Jazakumullah uh, khair for uh, for inviting me. Uh, inshallah, we're going to be talking the first session uh, about Tezkiyah. Uh, Tezkiyah is one of the most important areas of our deen. Why? Because it's to do with the heart. And the heart is at the center of our deen. So if we don't understand how the heart works, and I'm not talking about medically here, of course, I'm talking about the way the heart works emotionally and spiritually. If we don't understand our hearts, then how can we ever get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So today, inshallah ta'ala, me and you, and please, brothers and sisters, put uh, uh, comments up, put questions up. Um, you know, work along with me here, inshallah. I'll be throwing questions out to you as well. You can throw questions back at me. I'll answer as many as I can, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and then we'll move forward together. Jazakumullah khair. Now, the questions that we're going to be answering today or exploring together, inshallah, are really, you know, it's three main questions. The first question about the heart is, how can we make our hearts strong? How can we make our hearts strong? In this modern world, it's really difficult, isn't it? Sometimes to um, to get our hearts closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've got the dunya all around us. We have like shops and stuff and things and uh, everybody's busy and everyone's stressed. When do we get that me time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to build our hearts closer to him? Because believe me, wallah al brothers and sisters, I promise you, I promise you, if you follow the keys that I'm going to give you, and I'm going to give you some keys to open doors, inshallah. Not from me, from Allah, subhanAllah. I'm just passing on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us. So what we're going to do is look at how we can use a key to open the doors to open our hearts to Allah and get close to him. And then believe me, every single thing that you do in your life, you're going to have this amazing thing that... Every single person, and if there are non-Muslims on here as well listening, uh, very welcome, I'm very pleased to meet you. Um, if you think about the one thing that every single human being is aiming for, it's what? It's inner peace, right? It's inner contentment. It's sakina. In Arabic, it's sakina. So how do we get sakina? We talk about sakina a lot, right? But how do we actually get that? So inshallah, we're going to be talking about that. The second thing is how can we cleanse and wash our hearts so that we get this, this barrier down between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can get closer to him. And the third thing we're going to be talking about, inshallah, is how can we open our hearts to receive the sweetness of Iman? Iman, if you're a non-Arabic speaker, maybe a new Muslim, Iman, it means it has a lot of root meanings, but the main meaning is the faith. It's the feeling of faith. And, and the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually described Iman as and the feeling of Iman as being like a sweetness. I want you to imagine the the best sweet that you've ever tasted. It might have been like a dessert. I know there's a lot of dessert shops around nowadays. There is in the UK anyway, subhanAllah, they're very good. Imagine the best dessert that you ever tasted and then imagine that it's taken away from you and you get this feeling, Asalaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, wa Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. You get this feeling that you want that food again and again and again. This is why the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used this beautiful metaphor as saying that Iman is a taste of sweetness. Because when, just like when you have this, this Iman and you taste it and you want more and it goes up and down, up and down. And this is, this is normal, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'll just tell you a little story. Uh, they, and, and maybe you're going to know this already, inshallah. Uh, actually, the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, the Sahaba, I'm just going to try and translate all the Arabic to English as well, inshallah, for, for non-Arabic speakers. Sahaba means the companions around the, the Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the Sahaba would, um, when they were with the, the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Sahaba would be feeling a very high Iman. Of course, they're with 
the most amazing human being that's ever lived, uh, the, the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So then, walikum salam wa rahmatullah. So then, after the Sahaba would leave for the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they'd be going about their daily business, right? And then their iman would go down. It's natural. Do you know, subhanAllah, the, the iman of the Sahaba was so strong that they would actually fear and question themselves that, am I munafiq? I'm a, am I a hypocrite? Because I don't feel, I feel so, this iman up here when I'm with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then when I'm away from the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my iman goes down. And they used to really like beat themselves up inside about this until the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, it's it's fine. This is a normal thing. Iman, it goes up and it goes down. So brothers and sisters, if you're worried about your iman going up or down, it, it's it's OK. When it goes down, then we have to work that little bit harder. It's like when you're in a race and you're getting to the end of the race and you're kind of tired but you have to run a little bit faster and put more effort into that race. This is like the Iman. We have to put more effort into it. There's a beautiful, beautiful hadith uh, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us. And this is related in Bukhari. There is a piece, a piece of flesh inside the body. And if it becomes good and pure, then the whole body becomes pure. But if it's spoiled, then the whole body is spoiled. And that is the qalb. It means Arabic, it's heart, the heart. Now, actually, do you know something very interesting I read uh, more recently? That the, the scientists and the, and, the, and the doctors who've actually been uh, uh, looking at the heart and its purpose beyond the physical purpose have, ha have actually said, subhanAllah, that there is actually more to the heart than just physically pumping blood around the body. It's just amazing. They've actually said that it's the center of the emotion. So we know we have the, the brain, which is the center of ilm, knowledge and wisdom, yet the heart is, sense, is the center of our emotion. And it makes sense, right? Imagine something really bad happens to you and you, uh, and maybe you lose somebody you love. SubhanAllah. If you've gone through this, brothers and sisters, I, I, I feel sorry for you, but use it as an opportunity to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes things away from us in order to put us closer to him. So everything has a very a beautiful meaning in Islam. There's never anything negative. But when something is taken away from us, we have like a feeling or an, an emotional reaction, correct? But that emotional reaction, you don't feel it in your mind. You feel it in your heart. And this is actually proof that the heart is, of course, the center of Iman and the center of emotion. And also, Wallah Ladeen, brothers and sisters, the Iman, the, 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 the Iman in the heart, the heart also serves as a great guide to us as well. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. Let's move on just a little bit. So how can we purify it? How can we understand its nature? Now, how many of, of, of you out there are listening in from a mobile phone, mobile device? Maybe you're on your mobile phone, right? You can just put some comments for me. Let, let me know where, where you're tuning in from. Let me know where you're tuning in from. Where, which part of the world are you in, brothers and sisters? Um, I'm from the, from the UK, um, so I'm very pleased to meet you, alhamdulillah. So what is the one of the most irritating things about your smartphone okay people who've joined now this is not a lecture about smartphones don't worry it's a lecture about iman i'm just giving you an example bristol oh you're our neighbors then mashallah so what's the most irritating thing about a smartphone the charge goes down really quickly correct and then what you have to do, you have to plug it into the electricity and the, the battery is going to go back up. If you've got an old smartphone, it's not going to go back up. It's just going to die and be really irritating. But that's beside the point. The heart is like the phone that needs constantly charging. If we charge our hearts, then we will get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the charge of the heart? The charge of the heart is so many different things. It's when we we get the Iman higher and higher. Now, what drains the battery on the telephone? We, yes, Iman with Sabah is very important. Jazakallah khair. When we're on the telephone, we drain, dra we're draining the battery, correct? With the heart, what happens is we drain the Iman from the heart with unresolved sins. When we're doing a lot of sins 
and we we what happens is we build a wall up like a like a barrier or a boundary between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and unfortunately because we tend not to not to do toba in the correct way or we are uh, we're not even recognizing the sins then it's collecting higher 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 and we feel our iman or our heart charge going lower and lower sometimes sins are barriers between us and allah so for example um if you're somebody who 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 doesn't pray salah and brothers and sisters don't beat yourselves up over finding it difficult to pray salah you're not the only ones but imagine you're praying salah and you're not even trying to establish the salah in your life then we are saying inshallah inshallah you know this subhanallah the difference between the islamic inshallah and the muslim inshallah yeah the islamic inshallah is when somebody says inshallah and they really mean it you know i'm gonna do this that the, the islamic one the muslim inshallah is when you know people say inshallah brother and they just don't do anything inshallah is a way of saying no sometimes so brothers and sisters you're using allah's name we must make sure we use inshallah in a very good way and we really mean what we're saying so sometimes we leave ibadah and we leave the salah can you imagine brothers and sisters and this is another lecture that i i can give you about the salah and how to get closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the salah but please brothers and sisters i don't know what time it is in your part of the world please Allah Hadim, don't go to sleep tonight without making the intention to wake up for fajr in the morning imagine if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the medical mode the de the angel of death and your last intention was to not do a farad ibadah subhanallah sometimes we leave ibadah this puts this barrier between us and allah sometimes we don't think about allah enough we we neglect thinking about this and oh it's okay inshallah i'm gonna do this when i'm 50 or when i'm 40 or or when such and such happens i'm going to do this but then what happens if we die before we do this it's a very important thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Shams, and by the soul and he who fashioned it and inspired it to know between its evil and its goodness, he has indeed succeeded who purifies it. Whoa, what powerful language Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Quran here. So it's showing us here that we have to have some input into the heart. We are the ones who have to start by purifying our hearts. I'm going to link this with the most beautiful Qudsi hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is a long hadith, I'm going to give you just a small part of it, inshallah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this Qudsi hadith that my that the, 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 the servant uh, goes a step, walks towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then Allah will run to the servant, correct? We've all heard the hadith. Did you ever think, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, who makes the first move in this hadith? Who makes the first move in this hadith? It's you. It's me. First, the servant walks to Allah and then Allah will run to the servant. OK, we're going to see some more examples of that later, inshallah. So you have to make the first move. Sometimes the first move is the most difficult move. I know that. And it takes you out of your comfort zone and stuff. But leave, believe me, wallah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises this in this hadith. If you walk to, towards him, he's going to run to you. So whatever problems you have, if it's getting your heart close to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you start walking and you're going to see change in your life. Really, honestly, subhanAllah. Now, so input, like the charge of the battery, is the tarbiyah, okay? Tarbiyah, it means like an input or a development. This is more Arabic. Uh, brothers and sisters, if, if you're not Arabic speaking, then write down the terms that I'm giving you and learn them as part of the, the lectures, inshallah. And I'll be testing you next week on this. Now, there are two different types of tarbiyah. okay? There is a positive tarbiyah or a good tarbiyah that we can put into ourselves, OK, so that's building up our good deeds and doing khair or good. Or there is a negative tarbiyah. And when we do a negative tarbiyah, of course, that's going to lead to negative results. Tarbiyah doesn't just mean something good. Tarbiyah can also be a negative tarbiyah as well. We're almost doing the opposite of developing. We are undeveloping ourselves. Subhanallah. Now, 
what is a what is an, an indication of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees inside our hearts. Nobody else can see inside our hearts except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in order to succeed, we must purify this. So I want you, brothers and sisters, to ask yourselves some questions, some very, very important questions. Number one, do I implement Allah's farad, obligatory actions on myself? Okay, forget the people around you, on you. Do you implement the farad prayers on yourself? Do you implement, for example, if you're a sister, do you implement, implement the hijab on yourself? If you do implement the farad on yourself, then you can start mentioning and start thinking about what level of iman you have. And then you've got a foundation of where to start, correct? So why do I do the good things that I do? So there are lots of different levels of iman. We're going to talk about a few of those. We're going to talk about the first level. The first level is maybe when somebody fears Jahannam. So if you're one of those people, and, and none of these are wrong, they're just different levels. And of course, we're aiming to get to the, the highest level of, uh, of iman, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put, put you and me at this higher uh, at the highest level of iman, inshallah. So we could do the things that we do because, the good things that we do because we fear the jahannam. We fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We could do like the businessman or the business person that we're bargaining. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that if we do this, then we're going to get this. So it's like a bargaining type of iman. And then the next level up is the, the things that we do, the khair that we do in our lives to get Allah's pleasure. Oh, we're getting near the top now, brothers and sisters, subhanAllah, to get Allah's pleasure. Some of us, we think that that's the top level of iman. No, it's not. I'm going to tell you a, a, a beautiful story about the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha, radiallahu anha, she would see the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would stand and do qiyam every single night. Qiyam alayl, it means to stand the night in, 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 in prayer. And so what would happen is that he would stand the night in prayer and he would stand the night in prayer to the point where his feet, they used to get sore and, and pain. And Aisha radiallahu anha said to the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why is it that you're standing the, the, the prayer in night every night, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you Jannah? Allah has already promised you a, a place in paradise. And you know what the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her? He said, can I not be a thankful servant? This is the very highest level of iman that anyone can get to. The iman of shukr lillah, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything we get. So this is the level we need to be aiming for because this is the level of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another thing that you can ask yourself is, can I forgive other... This is where it gets difficult now, brothers and sisters. When somebody does wrong to you, when somebody does dhulam on you, when somebody hurts you, how easy do you find it to, for, to forgive that person? How easy do you find it to forgive that person who's done wrong to you? And when do you forgive that person? Do you forgive that person as soon as they've done the wrong to you and you're feeling hurt and angry, but you still forgive them? Or does it take a long time? Or, or are you a person who never forgives them? And subhanAllah. Forgiving people, regardless of what they've done to us, is part of the sunnah of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we truly, truly want to climb the, the ladder of iman, we need to try and forgive other people. And believe me, that's going to clear your heart of lots of negativity and it's going to be good. Yeah. Am I a proud person? Do I always think that I'm correct about everything? Do I look down on other people or do I keep a, in a humble place? Would I be confident? And this is the ultimate question, brothers and sisters. If the angel of death was to come to me right now and to come to you right now, are you satisfied and happy that the state of your soul that you're going to be taken in is going to be that Allah will be pleased with you? If the answer is yes, Jazakumullah, I wish that I was you. Because subhanAllah, that would be a very nice... But if, if, if the angel of death comes now, 
are you are you happy to go back to Allah in the state that you're in right now? If the answer is no, and for the majority of us, including myself, it should be no, then of course we have a lot of work to do before we go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delay the taking of our souls until he is going to be pleased with us, inshallah. So now we're going to talk about the first test. I'm going to throw this out to you guys, brothers and sisters. What was the first test, the first lesson of mankind? What was the first lesson of mankind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us? If you can put in the uh, in the comments, that would be amazing. If you can remember what the first test of mankind is. Now, subhanAllah, sometimes we have sins that are unresolved. And there is a way to resolve them. And this is really, really important. And we're going to go through this together now. Any of you who have been at university or school or college, you will know the process of evaluation. Okay. Critical thinking or self-criticism all right this is something that as human beings we are terrible at we don't like to point the finger at ourselves right remember the last time you did a sin you did something wrong and maybe people were around you or whatever okay the first thing that the most people do is to make excuses right we make excuses oh but this was the circumstance or that was the circumstance or this person made me do it. Or the shaitan whispered and I listened. Brothers and sisters, the shaitan on the Yom Al-Qiyamah will throw you to one side. Subhanallah. The shaitan will be like, I just whispered to them. I didn't force them to do anything. The shaitan will not ever be able to physically force you to commit something haram, to do a sin. He can't do that. He doesn't have it in his power. He whispers. He knows you well. He knows your weak points. And that's why you have to put your guard up. He's your enemy. However... He can't force you to do anything. Can you ever blame circumstance or anybody else for your own sin? The answer to that is a clear no, of course. On Yom Al-Qiyamah, people will make excuses using their tongues. They will even lie in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using their tongues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he's going to do? He's going to silence the tongue. Whoa, and he's going to make the limbs of the body speak and they will be witness for you. The hand who we touched somebody in a haram way will, will be speaking and saying, actually, she made me do this and he made me do this because the, the, our limbs, they don't want to commit haram. The heart, it doesn't want to commit haram. That's why we do, when we do a sin, the heart feels bad. Uh, subhanallah, until we start building this negativity and then we get used to it and sinning becomes, becomes like a normal thing. And that's when we're in a really dangerous place. So nobody has actually told me what was the first lesson of mankind. So I'm going to share it with you now, inshallah. So we all know the story of the first created man by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Adam, alayhi salam, and his wife, Hawa, alayhi wa salam. Now, when we look in the Quran, we can see the process of the, the first lesson of mankind. If we reflect the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to reflect on the lessons that it's giving us because every single lesson has very important learning points in. And the story of Adam alayhi salam, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this as the first lesson of, of, of mankind? Because it's the most important lesson that we can have. And we're going to go through that lesson now in a, a very, uh, inshallah, very understandable way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts Adam and Hawa in this amazing place, right? And then Allah says to them, you can have anything you like except the fruit from this tree. The fruit from this tree is forbidden for you. You don't go near this tree. But Adam, alayhi salam, and Hawa, alayhi wa salam, they are human beings. So they have the capability of what? Of sinning, okay? Of doing wrong. They have a will of their own. So, I mean, can you imagine, like, in, subhanAllah, every day we see things that tempt us, right? I mean, brothers especially, wow, if you live in the, the West, Wallah al-Azim, I feel so sorry for you. The fitna, it's everywhere. And keeping the eyes down, if you're not going to see some fitna, you're going to stitch your eyes to the floor, Wallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all with this. So Adam, alayhi salam, he, they see the tree together and it's tempting, it's always tempting, something that we can't have. So they go to the tree and they eat from the fruit. Yeah. As soon as they eat from the fruit, what happens? Their nakedness becomes apparent to them. 
Subhanallah. So, so far, so far, brothers and sisters, what's happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't acted at all yet. And this is going back to the hadith that I was mentioning to you earlier. So far, Adam a.s. has been given a will of his own. He's chosen to do the wrong thing. He's eaten from the fruit and his wife has eaten from the fruit. And then what? He realizes that he's done something wrong. Now, this is the most critical point. When you have sinned and you've done something wrong, it's admitting and pointing one finger to yourself and saying, actually, that was my responsibility and I did wrong. The minute that you're blaming other people is when you where the pride and arrogance comes in and the heart will never be fixed until there's a finger on one person and it's yourself. I did wrong, subhanAllah. Adam a.s. Does, does this. He does what's called muhasaba. Muhasaba is, was actually a term first coined or first mentioned by um, Umar ibn al-Khattab, who mentioned that take account of yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes account of you. Now, when, so when we do muhasabi, we are pointing the finger at ourselves, we're checking ourselves out and saying, okay, what have I done that's wrong today? This is what Adam a.s. and Hawa, his wife, do after they've eaten the forbidden fruit in the tree, okay? What happens when you admit to yourself that you have done something haram and you're not blaming anybody else anymore? It's like, actually, that was me. Then you start to feel bad. Your heart starts to ache and hurt. Why? Because you have displeased Allah. You've you've let yourself down and you've displeased Allah. You've done something against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you change. You want to change things. So your heart, it starts to change and become repentant. So you've self-criticized. Your heart has changed. And then you want to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Adam a.s. does. So far, for what of the for what's happened so far, what happens? Allah hasn't stepped in yet. Remember the hadith that I was mentioning earlier? We're going to come to that back in a minute, inshallah ta'ala. So, so far nothing's happened except Adam a.s. has sinned, thought about it, accepted responsibility, and now he's doing toba. He is asking for Allah's forgiveness. As soon as the heart changes then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala steps in. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. As soon as we change our hearts, then Allah will step in and help us. So what does Allah do for Adam a.s.? salam? He gives him and gives us because it's in the Quran. Look it up in your Quran. Look at the tafsir. Look at different types of tafsir on it. Surah 7 verse 23. This is what Adam Alis says. Our Lord, we've wronged ourselves. And if you don't forgive and have rahma, mercy, we will surely be amongst the losers. Wow. How come we don't use this dua of Adam Alis every time we do something wrong? Subhanallah, subhanallah. So that is key one that I promised I would give you. This is key one to changing the heart, muhasaba, leading to toba. Okay, do you, you guys have time for me to give you another key to changing the heart? I have loads to say, but I know I've been going on for a little bit of a long time. If you want me to continue, I'm more than happy to continue, inshallah ta'ala. So the first part of the hadith that I was talking about before, the Qudsi hadith, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if my servant walks to me, I will run to him. There's another part of this hadith. And this is key number two to changing the heart. Expectations. I'm from the UK. Um, expectations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to have the highest expectations of him. Why? Because this leads to tawakkul in Allah, to, um, to reliance or trust in Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this Qudsi hadith, if my servant comes walking to me, I will go to him at speed. And he also says, I am as my servant expects me to be. But how many of us have actually, we say we love Allah, but we have very low expectations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We make a dua, for example, and we don't really truly believe from the bottom of our hearts that it's going to be answered. 
Whereas Allah actually promises that he will answer the dua, promises it in the Quran. How can we ever doubt that? But our hearts, we doubt that. When we make a dua, you have to have very high expectation that Allah will answer you. Allah might not answer you in exactly the way you want or you expected. That's because Allah is Al-Hakim. He's the most wise and he will give you what is best for you. Subhanallah. So this leads on to Tawakkul in Allah. It strengthens hearts. Now I can hear you. You're sitting there thinking, okay, I feel my heart is kind of weak at the moment. All of us go through this weaknesses. You know, um, it's, do you know something? I'm going to give you a story. Let me tell you a nice story now, inshallah ta'ala. Because when tests hit us, and that can be the test of good times where we've got a lot, or it can be the tests of hard times where we have something taken away or a, a problem strikes us. There are a lot of you watching this right now. I'm sure that at least a few of you are having personal problems at the moment. Subhanallah. Life is full of personal problems and they all have khair in them, brothers and sisters, I promise. Now, sometimes we can't see past our nefs, our feelings when we have problems and we feel angry, we feel hurt, our pride is damaged. And all we can feel is negativity. I'm going to give you a beautiful story. There was a there was a woman at the time of the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and she was called Um Salama. And she was actually one of the the earliest uh, emigrants from uh, Mecca to Medina. And she was actually when she was. Uh, trying to leave the town of Mecca to go to Medina, what happened? Her tribe uh, managed to get hold of her child and take the child away from him and they wouldn't let her leave. Actually, her husband, Abu Salama, he was allowed to leave. They said, you can leave, but your wife is not going and your child is not going. On top, This is because they were Muslim. SubhanAllah, they were getting persecuted by the Quraysh because they were Muslim. So what happens is she had the child taken away from her any of you who if you're a mother if you're a father you will know the most heartbreaking thing to a parent is to have your child taken away like you know when you're in the supermarket sometimes and the kid like goes round the corner and you start getting crazy you you panicking because you think your kid is disappeared or someone took the kid or something can you imagine if your tribe or your family took your child away from you because you're muslim imagine how how high this test is subhanallah um Salama, radiallahu anha, she was so upset and the, the, the tribes actually fought over the child and the two different tribes were pulling the child to the point that his arms were coming out from his body. Subhanallah. Imagine a mother or a father seeing his child or her child go through this. Abu Salama left and went to uh, Medina. Um Salama would sit in a specific place in Mecca for a year, for 12 months, subhanAllah, she would go there each day and she would cry. Wow, oh, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard her tears. You know, whenever you cry, brothers and sisters, Allah, I promise Allah will hear your tears and Allah will respond to you. One of her cousins was watching her and this was, he was not a Muslim, but he was somebody who had a lot of rahmah in his heart. And he watched her cry and he felt pity on her. So he actually went to the tribe and he persuaded the tribe to allow her to travel with the child up to uh, Medina. And she was actually the first uh, female immigrant to Medina. But subhanAllah, later on in her life, her husband got really sick. Abu Salama got really sick. In fact, he got sick from an, in in an injury that he sustained in one of the battles, subhanAllah. So, he was dying. I want you to imagine that your spouse, um, your spouse is actually dying, subhanAllah. And there's no hospitals, there's no doctors, no GPs that you can run off to. Your spouse is dying and you're tending their wounds. You know your spouse is going to die. Now, when her husband was dying, and this is a massive lesson to us, brothers and sisters, when Abu Salama was, was dying, he, he actually came to, when she was tending him, he, he said to her, that he remembered a hadith of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this hadith said, when a Muslim faces disaster, which some of us do, when a Muslim faces disaster and says, to Allah we shall return and O Allah, reward me for my disaster and replace it with something better. 
he will get what he asks. SubhanAllah. Beautiful, beautiful hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Salama, radiallahu an, passed away. Actually, you didn't, do you know something amazing? When he passed away, he passed away and the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was actually in the, the house with him. SubhanAllah. And as soon as he died, when somebody dies, this is probably the, the greatest point of hurt, especially immediately after they died. I remember when my father died and it's, it's the point at when your heart breaks. Your heart breaks when somebody dies, right? Especially this immediate few minutes, hours, couple of days after they die. Do you know something? This was the result of the relationship that Umm Salama had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As soon as Abu Salama died and they loved each other so much, her heart was ripped apart. This was her soulmate has gone now. What's she going to do? Instead of going into mourning and going crazy like some people do or, or having this, this, this huge grief, she remembered the words that he gave her and she said, to Allah we shall return. Ya Allah, reward me for my disaster and replace it with something better. Umm Salama radiallahu anha ended up marrying the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re rewarded her by replacing her brilliant husband, Abu Salama, with the best of husbands, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umm Salama radiallahu anha was a, a normal person like you, like me. But because she had a strong heart and she built this heart over years and years and years, it's like when you go for a degree or an exam at college or university. You're not just going to jump into the exam without building the knowledge first, without building the, uh, the course and learning and practicing. Brothers and sisters, don't despair when you feel yourself going up and down in your iman and you're you feel that your heart is going weak and strong and weak and strong. This is a normal thing. So, inshallah, I've been talking for a long time now. I will, inshallah ta'ala, be joining you all um, every single week uh, for a different lecture, lecture each week and series of lectures. We're going to cover lots of different topics. Also, if you want any advice um, or guidance, inshallah ta'ala, you can um, message me um, on this page. Uh, or on my page, Ustada Amina Blake. And first of all, I'd like to uh, make a dua and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all, to guide you all, to bless your families and to bless your friends and to, inshallah, make your efforts um, to open the doors for Jannah. Inshallah, wa subhanaka la huma wa bihamdika, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Bismillahi rahmani rahim wal asr, inna linsan la fi khusr, illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat, wa tawasal birhaq. So Jazakum Allah Khair, inshallah, um, I will speak to you next week. I wish you all an amazing and blessed me best blessed week. So from me, Ustada Amina Blake, Jazakum Allah Khair, wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.